I am very lucky. I have this rather lovely gift, which I really appreciate every day. And my gift is that I can work out what's wrong with someone in three or four minutes. And usually, I can cure them in five minutes. And because it's quite a talent, I mean, I'm very lucky I got it. I'm always being asked to go on the radio and go on TV, and people ring up with their problems. And it's like, you've got to do your magic. You've got to cure them in five minutes. If it takes half an hour, it's not the same. So one day, I'm on this radio show. And this woman's rung up, and she is having such an anxiety attack. I can't even hear what she's saying. She's kind of going, <gasps> So I'm like, okay, I've got five minutes to sort this girl out. It's going to take me 20 to get her to breathe properly. So I'm like, okay, I've got to do this cheesy thing, but I've got, so I've got five minutes. I'm like, listen, just, just relax. Just imagine you're walking along the beach, and the sand is in your toes, and the waves are lapping. And she cut me right off and went, I can't do that. The beach is not available to somebody like me. And I'm a bit confused now. And she went, oh, yeah, well, you're English. You don't understand. I live in a trailer in Nebraska. I'm nearly 60 years old. I don't have any money. And she said it again. I have never been to the beach. It is not available to someone like me. And I'll probably never go. And I'm like, wow. If that was me, I would be taking three buses once in my life. I'm going to have the sand in my toes. I mean, I live in a country where turquoise water and sun was not available, but I do make a point of finding it. So, you know, she was a great gift to me because I remember thinking, how many people have that belief? It was quite early in my career. And a couple of weeks later, I'm working with this, well, I call him a squillionaire. This guy has got so much money. He owns swathes of London. He's a property mogul, and he's a chronic, chronic alcoholic. And Doctors always, always send me people they can't fix, like we can't fix him, send him to Marissa, we can't do anything with him, see what you can do. So in he came, and he said what all my clients say, I've been to rehab, I've done all of this, I just can't stop drinking, the cure is not available to me. And I'm like, you know, that isn't true. So I do something very different. I put people in hypnosis, and I count them back, and I say to them, when I count to three, you'll be back at the scene that has caused you to drink. And they always go back to it. And I like to do three scenes, because it's like being a detective. You take the scenes, and you kind of put them together. Then you explain to the client. Sometimes they explain to me, they do my job for me. Oh, yeah, I now I see that's happened, and now that's why. So I've got this guy in hypnosis, and I said, OK, we're going to go back to why you drink. So I counted to three, where are you? And he said, I'm six years old. What are you feeling? He said, no one loves me. Not a person in the world loves me. Okay. Obviously, I'm speeding this up for you. Now we've gone to another scene. Where are you now? He said, I'm seven years old. And he said, and my parents, they don't even like me. I don't understand. I have no one that loves me. And the next scene was pretty much the same. Where are you? Seven. What's going on? I don't understand why my parents hate me. There's nobody in the world that loves me. Okay, so now I'm daisy chaining this together and going, okay, so tell me now about the love in your life. And he went, well, I don't have any. He said, love is a bit of a foreign country to me. It's just alien. I've never had love. I have friends, I have staff, I have millions of pounds, but I don't have love. And um, I'm 66 years old, and I guess I never have love. And I'm like, and do you know why you drink? He said, no. I'm like, because that is so painful. When you're six, you can go, I don't understand. My mum and dad don't love me, but maybe I'll try really hard and I'll be smart and cute and kind and clever and they'll love me. And of course, it doesn't work because it's not the six-year-old's fault. And then they get to, oh, right, I've tried all this stuff. They don't love me because I'm not lovable. And once you buy into that, that's a real problem because you go through the world with this belief. And I want you to remember this expression, first you make your beliefs and then your beliefs make you. So be very careful about the beliefs you make because they make you. And once you've made a belief, guess what happens? You go out into the world and the universe matches your belief. So you believe, oh, dogs are vicious and bite you. Well, they pick up the energy and guess what? They are vicious and bite you. You believe, oh, dogs are wonderful. They're so loyal. They're your best friend. You could, when you leave here, 
decide, okay, I'm going to go out in the world and believe that people are dishonest and rip you off and are rude, and you will find that everywhere you go. And the next day you can wake up and think, I'm going to believe that everyone is kind of basically kind and good and will help me out. And guess what? You will find that too. And the problem is that we form beliefs and we've been on the planet for five years, six years. I'm not lovable. Love isn't available. Success isn't available. Money isn't available. Even health or happiness or believing I matter or I count, that's not available to me. So I talked to him and said, um, okay, so I'm getting your reasoning. Love wasn't available, and now it's not available. But you didn't appear to own swathes of London when you were six years old. You didn't inherit this empire. You went out and got it. Why don't you go out and get love? And he went, but I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, how do you know how to go out and buy all this land and all these hotels and all these apartments? So eventually I got him to understand that it was just a belief. And I said, you know why you're an alcoholic? Because it's so painful to say, I'm not lovable. Better to go, I'm not lovable because I'm an alcoholic. I don't have love because I'm an alcoholic. That's easier than saying, I'm not lovable. So this is what my clients tell me. Love isn't available. Relationships aren't available. Wealth isn't available. Success, health, happiness, praise feeling I'm significant, believing I matter, even compliments are not available. But the biggest one, the one that's on top of all the ones that should be on there, we'll fix that in the interval, is love. When you believe that love isn't available, it's very painful. And Diana was actually a fascinating girl to work with because her mother left when she was four. She was pretty much raised by nannies and then sent to boarding school. And she had a very interesting belief Love isn't available. I can find love, but I can't keep it. And because I've got so many amazing clients, you know, limos turn up at my house, bodyguards turn up at my house. I was standing in my neighbor's garden, and the other went, oh, I think that's for you. And this big limo came down my street, and out got four bodyguards, and two stood at the gate, and one stood at my front door, one came in the house, and out came this movie star. My neighbors always go... I don't understand. Why are these people coming? They've got everything. I'm like, yeah, except they don't feel lovable. So people think that fame damages people. Actually, I found the other way around. Damaged people want to be famous. So let's imagine there's someone standing here. They do, because you a little kid going, my parents don't love me. I don't have parents. I'm like a foster child or a stepchild. This isn't fair. How can I find love? And they go, I know. I'll become rich and famous and everyone will love me. So they go over here and suddenly they're rich and famous and they go, yeah, but you know what? They love this body. They love this talent. They love this voice. They don't really love me. And now they're screwed because when they were over there, they said, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to be loved. And I'm over here and I don't feel any different than I felt before. I still feel unlovable, and now I've got nowhere to go except down, and everyone knows about it. And that's when a lot of my clients start to implode because the drive to be famous is because they never felt lovable. And when they get fame, they still feel unlovable. So Diana did what a lot of people do. She gave what she wanted to give. Do you know the percentage of nurses that come from dysfunctional families is astonishing. It really is a calling. They give what they most want to get back. Not all of them, of course, but a huge proportion. And Diana could make everyone love her. She was magnetic. She was charming. But she never, ever believed that she was worthy of love. And the only person who wasn't captivated and madly in love with Diana was Diana. She didn't think she was lovable. And Marilyn Monroe was very interesting. Someone asked me the day if I worked with her. I'm like, no, I'm really not old enough to have worked with Marilyn Monroe. (laughs) But nevertheless, I know an awful lot about Marilyn Monroe because she was a classic example. She was born... And she was fostered immediately. Her her parents didn't want her. Mother gave her up. Father didn't want to know. And she went into the foster system. And when she was two and a half, she lived with a foster mother who had her own child, also two and a half. And of course, her own son would go, Mama, Mama, Mama. 
And Marilyn started to go, Mama, Mama, Mama. And the foster mother went, no, 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 you mustn't call me Mama. I'm not your Mama. You can call me Auntie. And every time they went to a park or a playground, Marilyn would go, there's a Mama, there's a Mama, there's a Mama. Because she knew she didn't have one. She felt completely different. And she kind of was already forming this belief that she was never going to have the love that other people had. And she went through life with an interesting belief that love is available for a little while because she would get a bit of love in the foster care, then she'd get moved. And when she married Arthur Miller, she was planning her divorce on the day she got married to him because of her belief that I'm not really lovable, I can get it, I can't keep it. And her shrink had said to her one day, Marilyn, what is going on with, you know, I've just seen this footage of you dancing in front of all these GIs. You're sewn into this dress, everything's falling out, and you have no underwear on. What is that about? And I'm going to quote what she said word for word. She said, I need everyone to love me. I must belong to the whole world because I have never belonged to anyone or anything in my whole life And I fear that I never, ever will. And that is a word-for-word quote. I need the whole world to love me. I must belong. I've never belonged to anyone or anything. And that is the real problem with feeling unlovable, that you kind of pick it up, and then it kind of radiates out from you, and people pick up your beliefs. So I was asked to work with Amy Winehouse, and I really wanted to work with her. She was quite a fascinating girl, and in preparation for my working with her, I read up a lot about her. I already knew Amy is an alcoholic, Amy is a drug addict, Amy is anorexic, and bulimic veers between the two. Amy has depression, and Amy is addicted to really damaged men that are going to bring her down. And she didn't turn up for any appointment, and I only ever spoke to her on the phone. And I said, well, why didn't you turn up? And she said, what's the point? I'm damaged beyond repair. Forgive me if I swear. She said, I'm complete. You can't help me. No one can help me. And the problem with Amy is that she did go into rehab and get clean many times, and she could give up drugs, and she could give up alcohol, and she could, for periods, stop being anorexic, but she could not give up this belief that being normal was not available to her. And you know, she never wrote a happy song. She wrote back to black. My tears dry on their own. Love is a losing game. If you listen to those lyrics, it's so tragic. that Even being loved, I'm going to lose at love. And then she wrote, I told you I'm trouble. You know I'm no good. And she really believed that. And if you listen to Back to Black, she's talking to her boyfriend and she says, you know, you go back to your old girlfriend, you go back to normality, and me, I go back to black. I go back to darkness. I go back to depression. I go back to being so abnormal and there's nothing normal available. And I know that it was that belief that killed her. It wasn't drugs. It was the belief that normality is not available. Of course, beyond that belief is the real belief, I'm not lovable. And see, Whitney Houston, she was the same. When she was 16 or 17, her record label pushed her as this God-fearing, deeply religious, pure, wholesome girl. That was okay, but she was already a drug addict, and she was already being told, you must not let anyone know your real sexuality. Hide that, you know, pretend you're madly in love with Bobby Brown and live a lie, and she did, and it was so abnormal. And she too had this belief, normality, that's not available to me. And then her poor little daughter was brought up in a house where normality was not available. So I'm gonna talk to you today about your beliefs, and I want you to think about what you think is not available to you. Who here, be brave, I'm not gonna embarrass anyone, it's not my thing, who here, might just have a belief that real, wonderful, lasting love is not available to them. Put your hand up. Who here might have a belief that being really, really successful and keeping that success going is not available to them? Who believes that money, making money, keeping money, not available? Who believes that knowing they are deeply significant, they really matter 
They're here for a purpose. They have an extraordinary gift. Who thinks, no, that's not available to me? Okay. And who here might believe that even being healthy isn't available to them? So, you know, someone told you this. No one comes into the world. A baby is born, and the first two experiences, everyone looks at them, the doctor, the nurses, the midwives. They go, oh, don't look at me. A bit fat today. My stomach sticks out. <laughs> Babies love being looked at. And if you take your baby home and shut it in a cupboard, what's going to happen? It will scream for days, because its belief is, someone's going to come and look after me, because I'm so cool. All my needs are met in the womb, so they're going to move out of the womb, and people are going to take care of me, because I'm lovable. And then someone, somewhere, tells you the opposite. And you've got to think, who is that person? What do they know? You know, even doctors tell people stuff that's wrong. I have the greatest respect for doctors, but I've met some in my time that you really want to shake. So, in come, I've got to see this woman who is suicidally depressed. And her doctor said, I, I don't know what to do with this woman anymore. Can you see her? And she told me something that really startled me. She said, every time I hear of someone who's got terminal cancer, I'm so jealous. I wish I could get terminal cancer and die. That would be my greatest dream. Because people with terminal, terminal cancer can die. They don't have to feel guilty. She said, my mum killed herself. My dad was a broken man. And I married someone just like my dad. And I really want to kill myself. But... It's going to break my husband's heart. It's going to break my dad's heart. So I'm cursed to live this miserable life with a depression that cannot be cured. And you know what she just said? The cure is not available to me. And I'm like, why do you think that? And she went, well, it's genetic. My mother killed herself with genetic depression. My grandmother had it. I've got it. There is no cure. And I'm like, actually, there is a cure. And guess what? You're in the right place to have the cure. I have cured hundreds of people, thousands probably, I might have exaggerated it to make her better, of suicidal depression. And since you're in my office and I'm going to hypnotize you, why don't you let me cure you? She went, okay. I said, right, I'm going to put you in hypnosis. We're going to go back to the cause of the depression. And so we went back to scenes I knew we'd go back to. The mother's killed herself. And we went back to her mother's funeral, and she didn't cry. She said, I, I didn't want to cry because, you know, my dad um, was broken. And I realized straight away because every scene was her being a good girl, her being perfect. And I so what she did is she decided to be a people pleaser. She really wanted to help out her dad. She never cried. She never complained. She never asked for anything. I went, you know what? You don't actually have depression. You have repression and suppression because you have no voice. You don't open your mouth and say what's going wrong. She married someone she didn't even love because he, he kind of loved her. She didn't want to hurt his feelings. And now she's got a mother-in-law who I swear is the bitch from hell. I said, God, I've heard of some mother-in-laws in my time, but this one, she's probably like the worst mother-in-law I've ever heard of. And you've got to stand up. She said, I can't. I said, you've got to stand up to her and say, get out of my house. And when you're at her house and she says those horrible things, get up and leave. And if your husband doesn't come with you, take the car, leave him there. But do not allow her to diminish you. And she said... I don't know what to do. I'm like, okay. So I got her in hypnosis. You're going to have to forgive me for swearing now, but it was very relevant. I said, okay, you're in hypnosis. I want you to imagine your mother-in-law is in front of you, and I want you to say to her, and she went, <laughs> I can't possibly say that. I could never say that. I said, you can. You can say it. So she kind of thought about it. She very attentively went off. She was terribly posh. And I'm like, okay, say it again. So she went, off. And I'm like, now say it like you. And all of a sudden she went, bitch, get out of my house. And she went, yeah, it was really cool. And she went, oh my, this feels rather marvelous. <laughs> Do it again. And she did it again. And she went, oh, this is magnificent. Do it again. I said, and you know the reason I'm making you do this is because you've come into this room with a belief that you have no voice and you can't express yourself because 
that's what you believed when you were seven, and you had every right to believe that at seven. But you've done what many people do. You've kept the belief going. You see, if you'd met Diana, if you'd met Marilyn, if you'd met even Amy, in the room was a beautiful woman. But really what was in the room was an absolutely damaged child. And these women kind of have this damaged child in them. And they are the damaged child more than the beautiful woman. And I said, look, when you were six, you had no power, no options, but you're 46. You've got to leave that little girl behind with no voice and find your voice. So when you go home today, all the way home, I want you to keep saying, and so she had on a twin set and pearls, an Hermes bag, a little Hermes scarf. And I watched her walk out of my office going, get out of my house. And she wrote to me about three months later and said, I must tell you something. When I left your office, I hated you. She said, I could not believe what you made me say and what you made me do. She said, and I was rather affronted, actually. She said, but I have to tell you, in the last few months, I've lost 36 pounds. My mother-in-law doesn't bother me at all. I'm not depressed. And I remember what you said, repressed and suppressed, And I'm not those either. I want to tell you, I don't hate you anymore. In fact, I rather adore you now. And I've been telling all my friends about you. Three years later, she telephoned me and she went, I want to tell you something extraordinary that's just happened to me. She said, I got a letter from my doctor saying, you must come in urgently, urgently. We need to see you. So she went in thinking, what's gone on? And her doctor sat across the table and went, you're not filling your prescription for antidepressants. What is going on? And she went, well, I haven't been depressed for three years. I've had therapy. With that Marissa Peer, she didn't really say that. And um, I'm no longer depressed. And he went, it will come back. You have genetic depression. It will come back. You're going to have it all your life, and you need to take medication all your life. And the previously suppressed, repressed woman went, do you know, doctor, what is not coming back? Me to your office. I will never come back here again. Yeah, right on. You will never be my doctor again. How dare you tell me that? And she left. And I love that because just because he was a doctor and he told her that, That didn't mean it was true. You see, whatever you tell your mind, it will believe. So let me do something with you. I want you to just put your arms out in front of you as if you're holding like reins or the handlebars of a bike. Just put out your hands and close your eyes. And I want you to imagine, to tell yourself that in your left hand you are holding an enormous red fire bucket and it's filled with 60 pounds of sand, and it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. So in your left arm, you're holding a bucket of sand, and it is so heavy, you can feel the weight right up into your shoulder. You can feel it in your elbow. You can feel it in your wrist. Your left arm is getting heavier and heavier and heavier, and the harder you try to keep your left arm up, the heavier it's becoming. And in your right arm, you're holding a huge helium-filled balloon, a big blue balloon. It's bigger than you, full of helium, completely weightless. And now your right arm is floating and moving and pulling and lifting and traveling up. And the harder you try to push that right arm down, the more it feels as if you are trying to push a balloon underwater. It just insists on springing up lifting up, traveling up, getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And all the time, your left arm is getting heavier and heavier. And the harder you try to lift up your left arm, the more it feels like it's been encased in concrete. And the harder you try to push your right arm down, the more it feels like it's attached to a pulley that is pulling it up. And just notice, one arm is weighed down, one arm is weightless because of a belief I just gave you. It's a belief. So keep your arms where they are. Open your eyes. And look around the room. You see, beliefs 
are real. Beliefs are things. So let's do another one really quickly. Thank you. I want you... Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want you to put your hand up by your mouth right now. I want you to imagine you're holding in your mouth a big, fat, juicy Costa Rica lemon. And you can breathe it in and nothing smells quite like that wonderful lemon smell. And you can feel that waxy lemonness. Smell it, feel it. Open your mouth. Cram that lemon in. Just shove that lemon into your mouth. Start sucking it and chewing it and biting it. Suck out all the flesh. Swirl it around. And what is happening is, of course, you are reacting to a thought. Not a good thought, not a bad thought, a neutral thought. But you see, we react to thoughts, and we don't upgrade our thoughts enough. And time and time again, I go back to people who come up with beliefs they made, who've been on the planet for five years. They made a belief, I'm not good enough. There's never going to be enough money. I'm not pretty or handsome or smart or strong. No one's interested in me. And we keep those beliefs for no other reason than they're familiar. So I sat in a doctor's office um, when I was in my 20s, and he said to me, you will never have a baby. You must accept you are infertile. You can't have children. But even in my 20s, I was already very far advanced in hypnosis. And I said, I'm going to stop you there because I'm not letting that in. So I'm just going to leave. And I don't want to hear anything you have to say because I know I'll have a baby. And actually, I got pregnant really easily. And then, having been told that having a baby was not available to me, now I've got new things. Well, you're never going to have a normal pregnancy. You'll probably lose the baby. You know, if you carry it to full term, it will have all kinds of things wrong with it. Because I was diagnosed with an illness that turned out I never even had. And they said, yeah, well, the baby's going to have the same illness that I actually never had, ever. (laughs) But... I seem to have a great pregnancy. They told me my baby would be born at under four pounds, and suddenly she was seven and a half pounds. And I knew that I was having a baby was available to me. Having a perfect baby was available because I was going to make it available. And then I went off for my pre-birth talk, and they said, what kind of birth are you having? I'm like, hypnosis. They're like, are you crazy? You're going to have a baby under hypnosis? This is a nurse saying to me, do you know... Giving birth is like sitting on a stove with a gas ring turned on. (laughs) It's agony. You can't have a baby under hypnosis. I'm like, well, what do you think people in Africa do? They went, oh, well, they've got different shaped pelvises. (laughs) That's how they give birth in a field. I'm like, okay. What about people in India? They don't seem to have different shaped pelvises. Last time I looked, well you can't have a baby under hypnosis. I'm like, well, I'm actually doing a recording for the BBC, so, and they're coming to record me having a baby under hypnosis. I pretty much think I am. Anyway, I had an amazing birth. Um, I had the BBC in the room. I had my mum, my stepdad, my friends, the baby's dad. It was like a party in there. And I had my baby really easily. I just pushed her out. It was so simple. In fact, I felt like I'd been out and bought her because I went to the hospital... (laughs) Gave birth to my little baby in like two hours and then went up on the ward and it was like, wow, I just feel like I've been to a store and got this amazing, gorgeous thing. Anyway, I woke up the next day. In England, we we have wards. We don't really have private rooms in maternity hospitals. And the nurses were coming around giving everyone a box of Kleenex. And I'm like, what's that for? She went, that is for the postnatal depression. Everybody gets that on day three. On day three, the whole ward is crying and weeping. It's okay, you know, it's just the hormones. When you give birth, your body starts to lose all the hormones, and then you get postnatal depression. I went, oh, no, 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 no. I'm actually having postnatal euphoria. I'm having it right now, and I'm going to keep having it for weeks to come. And they looked at me like I was nuts. I said, yeah, I actually haven't signed up for postnatal depression. <laughs> but I have signed up for postnatal euphoria. And since you told me the ward's going to be a sea of weeping and crying, I said, you know, I get there in my office every day, weeping, wailing, crying. I don't really need it on my first day with a baby, so I'm just going to go home. 
So I got my little baby, got a taxi, went home. And I didn't realize, because my partner had the house keys, that I was locked out of the house. And we, we were not having a great relationship. I didn't even know where he was. I shouldn't care, I have to say. I was so in love with my baby, he wasn't important. But I couldn't get in my house. But I had my car keys. So I put my little newborn baby in the car, and I rang my mum and said, Mum, I'm going to come and stay with you. Well, she was delighted, and I drove to Cambridge. In England, when you have a baby, you have to have a midwife come every day for 10 days to check out you and the baby. It's kind of the law, and it's a good thing. And if you don't have it, they don't like that. So I had to ring London midwife and go, look, I'm not in London. I'm in Cambridge, so they can send me a Cambridge midwife. So now my daughter's two days old. I've gone to my mum's, and I'm wheeling her out in a little push chair and I've just come back to the house as the midwife arrives and she looks and she goes why are you out I'm like pardon should why are you out I'm like well it's a nice day she went no but you should be in bed you should be in bed for a week and your baby should be in bed for a week because of all the germs and I'm like well what do people do when they've got seven kids do they go to bed for a week I don't think so and you know I spent a lot of time in Africa and I don't see people going to bed for a week with their newborn baby and she's like, no, you, you really should go to bed for a week. And then she said to me, anyway, how did you get here? And I said, I drove my car. And she went, oh, do you not know about pregnancy brain? I'm like, fortunately, I have no idea about pregnancy brain. But I know you're going to tell me what it is. And she said, yes, when you've given birth, you can't concentrate. You can't focus. You can't do anything normally. It's like, well, just as well I didn't know that when I took an hour and a half drive down the motorway. I didn't have pregnancy brain. I didn't have postnatal depression. And it really annoyed me that they told me that was available to me. So now I'm raising this great little kid that I've thought, been told I can't have. And um, I'm reading this report about how girls who are adopted, if their adoptive mother walks around the house going, oh my God, I've got my period. Oh, so painful. Oh, these cramps are killing me. Oh, I need to take to my bed they have the same kind of periods. Normally, not always, of course. There's always an exception. And adoptive girls whose mother say, I've got my period, I'm off to play tennis now, have very different periods too. So my little daughter, who's five, and she's gone to stay with my mum, and she came back and she started walking in the house going, oh, I've got my tension headache. I've got my anxiety. And I'm like, baby, five-year-olds don't have tension headaches <laughs> or anxiety. That is grandmother's stuff. It's not yours. And so we go to my mum's a lot. And one day she said to her, my mum, grandmother, what are all these pills for? My mum goes, well, that one's for my legs, and that's for my head, and that's for the angina, that's for my heart, that's for my bowels. My little girl goes, but grandma, how do you all know where to go? <laughs> and now I've got to prep my daughter, because every time she goes to my mum's, she was going on a school trip, and she came back, and my mother gave her a little parcel, and she gave her antiacids for after dinner. She gave a travel sickness travel tablets to go on the coach. And she gave her altitude tablets <clears throat> in case they went somewhere high. <laughs> and I'm saying, you know, baby, we don't do pills, you and me. We're not sick. And she went, but mummy, is grandma sick? I said, no, darling, grandma's not sick. Grandma's a hypochondriac. Those people, they're not sick, but they love taking pills because all my life, my mother, her house is like, she's lovely, but her house is like a farm. So you want a drug, she's going to have it in her cupboard. And when I grew up, I thought that is never, ever going to be available to me. I'm going to be fit and healthy. And I sometimes think I became a therapist and cured people because I looked at this madness of the pills and the hospital trips every day. So I've said to my little girl, grandmother's not sick but she's a hypochondriac. And, you know, when you go to stay with grandmother, when you get in the car, do not let her give you pills. After dinner, do not let her give you pills. So at this big family dinner, and my mother, she's got this syncretic, and she puts out the dessert, she brings out the antiacids simultaneously. And my little girl looked at my uncle and she said, you know, my grandmother's a nymphomaniac. Mummy said that's why she takes pills. But my mummy's not a nymphomaniac. And we don't take pills. And I'm like, no baby, no hypochondriac. <laughs> the correction didn't please my mum. <laughs> so I want you all to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine you're holding in your arms you. You, the day you've just been born. 
You're this beautiful, perfect, brand new baby. You just came out of a womb where everything was available 24 hours a day. You got food, you got heat. It was always 75 degrees in there. All your needs were met. And you'd just been born. And I want you to think, that little child who's just been born, what should be available to that child is masses and masses of love. But you know, that's often not the case. My mom told me that when she had me, she was really upset because I was supposed to be someone else's baby, my dad's best friend, as it happened. And years later, when I was doing hypnosis, I felt that. I felt that disappointment. But it didn't matter because that was just the beginning. That's not my life. So I want you to imagine you've got this little baby in your arms. And I want you to think, what do you want to be available to that child? Do you want love to be available? Of course. What did you want the person holding you as a newborn to say? And I'm going to tell you, and you're going to repeat it out loud, and I want to hear you. I want you to say to that little baby, wow, look at you. Wow, look at you. Repeat it. Wow, look at you. You are the most perfect thing in the world. You're so beautiful. You're so gorgeous. You are completely lovable. And when you grow up, you're going to find so much love. Because love is available to you. And it always will be. Success is available to you. You matter. You're significant. You have a gift. And you're meant to be here. And keep looking at that little baby and just filling it up with love and praise. You know, I see a lot of clients of infertility, and although I have a really high success rate, I have a few clients who would sell their house to be parents, and there's no doubt they would be amazing parents, and it doesn't happen. They never get to have that baby that they would be phenomenal at raising. And I see other people who drag their kids up and really do not deserve to be parents. And I've often tried to work that out. Here's these people who be amazing parents and never get a baby. And these people who are dreadful parents who have three. And the only way I could ever work it out is to believe that we come through our parents. We don't come from them. The universe creates us, and the universe that creates us will support us in everything that we do, particularly in believing that we are lovable, that everything is available. So you can open your eyes, and I want you to think about that. One person would be an awesome parent, and they don't get the baby, and the other person is a horrendous parent, and they do. And how can you make sense of that? You can't except by deciding the universe created you. You come through your parents. You don't come from them. You come through them. And the universe that created you and that gave you all your amazing talents will support you in everything, everything that you want. 